Greetings, epic adventure seekers. Welcome to your guide to demystifying your world. I'm Ellie Bierman, and you are listening to Let's Get Metaphysical, connecting heart and mind. If you've not yet done so, please rate and review the show so others can find us. And it's really easy to do on our new website over at Let's get metaphysical show.com. When you scroll down under the episode, there's a nice little button that says leave a review. Just a couple sentences what you like about the show, maybe what you think somebody else would like. And um, please share it. You know somebody who's looking just like you are to find out how come my life looks like this? Okay, today's guest is Jacqueline Chalice. She is known as the excitable introvert, and you are in for a treat. Before jumping in, here's a question for you. Have you given up on using affirmations because they never seem to work? Well, if that regretful sigh I heard was you, today is the time to take advantage of my Cliff Notes version of my affirmations program. And you can download that guide today. The link is in the show notes. Jacqueline Chalice, well known as the excitable introvert, guides introverted women of color to get seen, heard, and respected by embracing their awesome. Known for her energy, enthusiasm, and flair, Jack Jacqueline's decades of communication and personal leadership experience blossomed her from a challenging but accomplished upbringing into international speaker and six-time global best-selling author featured in numerous media outlets, including Forbes, Dr. Oz, International Business Times, Romper, Market Watch, and Nerd Wallet. Jacqueline wows her audiences with her Embrace Your Awesome messages on stages in nearly 20 countries for Fortune 500 corporations, notable organizations, and educational institutions. Her fresh, unique perspective stems from her background as an award-winning performer, former newspaper columnist, broadcast journalist, and college instructor, all by voting age. When not globetrotting with coffee in hand or loudly singing, as she puts it, tune adjacent at home, you can find Jacqueline getting lost in a good audio book or hugging her son or his nine cousins and or the nearest tree. She's the founder of Awesome Enterprises LLC with great, great excitement. I now welcome you, Jacqueline, to our show. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to getting metaphysical. <laughs> Well, I suspect that you've been doing that all your life. Now, I was exploring your fabulous website, and your personality totally, totally pops off each page. And you epic adventure seekers, I recommend, wait until after our chat, but I recommend visiting her <laughs> website to continue your epic adventure today. Now, I got to ask, on your page, where you share your philosophy, there's a really interesting image. Now, I used to shoot archery way back in my teen years. I never looked like that when I was shooting archery. I was wondering, I couldn't figure out the picture. Could you explain how you created that or why? Yes, that, that photo, it's a picture of my son during one of our vacations. And so this is... I never intended to use it, but I love to incorporate my son in my work. He's my business partner, um, and he's as a nephew, the nine that we talked about. 
So this particular one I like to use because it's such a good visual metaphor for what it means to be not only an introvert, but as you're navigating life. So it's an it's an image for if you haven't gone yet, because we're having the conversation and you don't need to go to the website to find it yet. <laughs> it's an image of, of my, I think he was nine at the time, with just a flood of... Um, of arrows that are surrounding him. He's caught mid stride, dodging and almost like going over them. It's a beautiful encapsulation. This was taken in Montreal during one of our family trips. We surprised him by going to, there's a Nerf um, archery place. I believe it's called Nerf Bow. Um, so if you're ever in Montreal, look for Nerf Bow. They are amazing, amazing. So we went there not knowing what to expect. They also have Nerf um, Jedi um, Academy too, in case you want to know. So one of the things that they do you come in with your group. They have another group that comes with you and you shoot each other with arrows. <laughs> they are padded. They have a nerf padding on them, but you do these different types of archery games. And as you're doing this, as you're playing, they're taking these images as, as you're immersed in the game. This was one of those images and it was so fantastic. The experience while we were there was great, except my son kept shooting me. It's like, we're on the same team. You're not to, you're, shoot your father, don't shoot your mother. <laughs> that it, it it was a wonderful time it was a wonderful time i'm so glad that they took that shot it's one that you couldn't plan for like you couldn't capture that image if you tried not not as an amateur um, that's what it's from it it was one of those things it was such a beautiful shot but again when you're doing the things that you love and you're showing up in your life you've got to dodge those arrows you've got to learn how to navigate those spaces and be fluid and flexible and so my kiddo was able to encapsulate that and that's why it's on the site that's fantastic <laughs> i've never seen anything like that on anybody else's site but for, well, <laughs> that, that's powerful it's, that's what i'm telling everybody you want to go and look at this city. <laughs> you're going to discover things that just doesn't usually happen visiting a website so you're everything that you achieved by voting age how did you go from performer, and, and uh, if you will, let us know what kind of performer, to a newspaper columnist, to broadcast journalist, to college instructor, and all just before voting age? How did you do all that? Um, I was very fortunate. I was very, very fortunate to do a lot of things early in life. So I knew from a very early age, I knew that I would be a writer. I knew that I would be a speaker. I knew I would travel the world. I didn't know how any of those things would happen. I don't know why I knew that this was truth, but I knew that this was truth. So my entire childhood was shaped from that perspective. Like I'm the kindergartner who, instead of being a fireman or a doctor or a lawyer, my goal was to be a New York Times bestselling author. That was my aspiration. So you can imagine if, if a five-year-old is having this as an ambition, not your typical child, <laughs> not your typical um, parenting experience with raising and nurturing this type of child. And so I was that kid who was slightly off center and my, my parents were very supportive in those aspects of my growth. They were very supportive. And okay, if you want to be a writer and you're wanting to do these things, let's find some type of way to nurture that. And so my, my first taste of authoring came when I was 11. I was in a young writers program that my parents were able to find. And we published a book. We published an anthology. We had a small book tour um, at the time. And all of the kids ranged from, I think the youngest, I think the youngest kid was like maybe around nine or nine or 10 um, and went up to early teens. And so we were able to publish our first book that early as, uh, as kind of a pathway open for that. Once I wrote my piece and I, I was telling someone else, I don't even remember what the title of the book was. It is long since lost. I used to have a copy of it and it got lost in a fire. So it's, 
it's long gone. But from my chapter that I wrote, I was extended an opportunity to write a column for a local newspaper. And so I got to be a guest columnist. I got to interview um, the owner of the, of the radio station. I got to interview some other like local notable people um, and cover what today would be considered like social justice ish <laughs> type topics. Um, I, I distinctly remember upsetting the, uh, the, the owner of the radio station because the music I found to be offensive that he was playing. And so I asked him if this was something he would allow his children to listen to. And he was like, well, no, I wouldn't let my kids listen to this. So so then, sir, why do you think it's okay for other kids to listen to this and not yours? Being asked this by some, um, basically like some snotty 11, 12 year old who's asking you these hard hitting questions. Mm -hmm. But I got to have that experience um, with interviewing and then writing these articles for the column. And again, very early on, that led to it's all of these things that I've accomplished, it's been one stone leading to one stone leading to one stone. And what has allowed me to go kind of from this place to place to place largely has been that recognition and that knowing. I know with all certainty that this is a path I need to take. What I don't know is how I'm going to get there. I don't know why I'm going to do this. I just know that I am. So what do I need to do to play my role in getting to where I know I'm supposed to be? So even with something like writing, I knew I would be a writer. I know in order to write, you know, you need to write. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm going to write about. I don't know about any of this book business. I don't know any of that. All I know is I have an idea for a story. I know that I need to write so I can get practice being a writer. So then I'm going to write. <laughs> Same with speaking and with performing. I never had any intention of doing any type of performance. It was an opportunity that came through my church. And so there were a number of global um, competitions that they would have and international conferences that they would have that we got to go and we got to compete. So for singing, for speaking, and for performing interpretive dance, I was receiving awards for this and I got a special recognition I think it was, it was 15 or 16 when I got a special recognition for my speech. I was the top person out of, I think it was a dozen or so countries that were represented at this um, particular event. And I got a second award that they, that they made up. I'm using uh, my terminology. They said it a lot better. <laughs> they made up um, this award in recognition for the speech that I gave. So these sorts of things, I knew I needed to speak if I'm going to be a speaker. So let me say yes to this opportunity, as opposed to my natural inclination, which is just to not, you know, I'm not saying, how is that supposed to work? I haven't done this. I've never been in front of an audience of a thousand people. How am I supposed to do this? I'm only 14. I'm only 15. I only, only, only. Rather than getting lost and trying to figure it all out, it was really, it, I don't know how to better express it except to say I was compelled to stay on the path of saying yes, because every time that I would say yes to this image and this vision that I had, it opened up another pathway for another step to get me closer and closer and closer. So all of these different things and I got to be a co-host on um, on a, a very small, like within the school system, um, broadcast system or a broadcast show. So I would do morning shows that were broadcast throughout the district. Um, I, I forget how many schools that was, but that was that was my introduction to being on television and to understanding how to do TV shows, how to produce them. All of these different skills I got so early on, but they really allowed me to practice <laughs> much of the work and a lot of the things that I do now as an adult in what I do in my business. I've lived, I'm kind of like a cat. <laughs> I've lived a bunch of lives um, because I started early on and it's, it's amazing and it's a blessing to have been able to have so many experiences so early on. That's 
I have to take a breath. <laughs> but it's a lot. <laughs> when, when I used to have a hobby of reading biographies and all the great famous people who accomplished extraordinary things, their lives sound just like what you described your life to be, to know those things when you were a little, very, yeah, five years old, wow. I remember the day I learned the first three words, how to spell them, and I started writing that day. I was six years old. Mm -hmm. And have you ever experienced anything like this? Because I felt compelled to write all the time to the point where I get in bed and I'm going to sleep and all the thoughts going through my head, I'm typing them. Has that ever <laughs> happened? <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. I'm not yes. the only Even one. now. Even now that still happens. Even now there will be times I keep a little notebook on, on the bed beside me and that, that used to mostly work, but then I'd have to like fully awake because I would start jotting things down in the morning. I don't know what this chicken scratch is that I wrote in the dark. That, that didn't help me at all. Um, <laughs> so now I'll get up and if I'm not jotting down notes, then I may take my phone to the bathroom. I'll do a quick audio, um, like a voice note, um, do a quick one of those and then go back to sleep because my brain will still be processing these new ideas or yeah. these new epiphanies. Like, okay, I... I will not remember this in three hours. I've got to capture this right now and I'll figure out what to do with it once I wake up again. <laughs> uh, this is so extraordinary. I never met anybody who is similar to me because I've always done, I used to <laughs> carry a recorder with me because I constantly compose music in my head. And I definitely want to talk about this more. And I'm going to take a quick break, a quick sponsor break, and we will definitely go back into this. You got to ask questions. How to be healthy, safe, and secure. It's a book for you. You, you got to ask questions. questions. How can you know who you are and what you want in life? If you don't know what questions to ask, if you never step out of your everyday being in the same step, in the same pattern. Well, I originally sold this ebook, just the ebook for $97, and then I recorded it. So I have something really special for you. For just $47, you can get both the book and the set of recordings, and you will find the link for that in the show notes. So I, <laughs> what I was talking about with the music, you had mentioned that you would uh, walk around singing loudly in adjacent to. <laughs> and <laughs> what did you mean by adjacent to? <laughs> I mean, many of us know those people <laughs> who they are, they are singing with all of the passion that they can muster with all of the joy. And it is just a travesty, but it is made up because of how enthusiastically <laughs> they are singing. That's me. I'm that person. <laughs> I'm that person. I'm, I may not be at the tune. I may not be at the tone, but I'm really close and I'm really excited about how I'm singing it. Um, that is all the time. My son is 12. He's always cringing about that. That and mommy dancing while she's singing on um, Ultimate Cringe Fest. <laughs> oh, that, that's definitely fun. I love to make videos and I've been writing music all my life and I started making videos on YouTube very, 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 very many years ago. And one day I started playing one of my original ones and I usually am a good singer, but man, I played one and it was definitely adjacent to and I was singing this one. <laughs> Should I take it down or should I leave it there so people can see I'm better now than I was? Yeah, you use it and you repurpose it so that you can show the transformation. Because if you had let yourself stop at that moment, or if you had taken it away, now that you saw it, then all of the benefit that someone got from seeing it, from hearing it, now that's lost. So yeah, it becomes it becomes part of the journey. It's part of the transformation. 
and it's really extraordinary because people kept subscribing to my channel and I guess not all of them sounded so bad and they were getting value because I write songs to teach. So <laughs> they were getting what they were after. So when I first saw the headline on your website um, that you guide introverted women of color to get seen, heard and respected by embracing their awesome, I actually paused and wondered if you exclusively limited your clients to that genre. And then I thought, well, that would make any sense. <laughs> so I looked around, I saw the testimonials, and it was men and women and people of all kinds of colors. I think I ne get neglected to ask you, um, what does introvert mean for you? Right. Well, introversion, I think, has really gotten a bad rap. <laughs> needs to be fixed or needs to be overcome or needs to be put to the side um, as if it's a shirt, <laughs> it's a hat, it's a piece of furniture. Um, introversion is not about how someone is shy or is bashful or is antisocial, although that's what comes to mind when people hear that word. Introversion is simply how you internally process stimulation. The whole idea of introversion is it's a spectrum. There's not you're either extrovert or you're introvert or maybe you're an ambivert or an omnivert. Um, both of those are, are quite popular these days, but it's many shades of gray. And so the more that you need time to internally process, you're taking in all of the stimulation. And so you need to step away so your brain can sort through all of this that it's absorbed in order to form an idea. That's introversion. You're closer to that introverted side of the spectrum if that's you. For the extroverts, they need to externally process. So they can't just sit and reflect and get anything out of it. Their, their brains literally cannot do that. They need stimulation in order to even make sense of what's happening. So they have to engage with their world in order to process. So if you take, I often give the example, if, if I'm making the statement, I had a peanut butter sandwich. I'm making the statement to you. If you're closer to the introverted side of the spectrum, when I say I made a peanut butter sandwich, you're hearing those words. You're thinking, okay, she said that she made a peanut butter sandwich. What did she sound like? Was she really talking about something different? Which tell me what is her wallpaper? What else is going on? Should I respond to that? Is that a question? I don't really like peanut butter. Maybe I need to, our brains are doing all of this simultaneously. So this one statement, I made a peanut butter sandwich, prompted this entire nebula cloud of thought. <laughs> Introverts are doing this with every interaction. So whether it's something as simple as the statement, I made a peanut butter sandwich, or it's something that's more complex as we need to find a solution to, um, to raise our sales, let's brainstorm, which that could be a million different things. It creates this overwhelm because we're looking at for simultaneously hearing what you're saying, what you're not saying, how you're saying it. We're considering whether we should respond, if we should respond, how we should respond, how everything in the environment is interacting. We're doing all of this. And so understandably, our energy is drained. We're, we're juggling like 15 plates at once <laughs> over a statement about a peanut butter sandwich. Um, and so we need to step away from stimulation in order to sort through all of this that we took in to decide what's most important or not. Then we can respond. We can do something with that information. But we take in so much. We don't even know what's important until we have that moment to take a beat, to take a breath. Extroverts, completely different story extroverts are not going to be able to take a moment away and kind of ponder and reflect in order for them to take the same sentence, I made a peanut butter sandwich. They hear me saying, I made a peanut butter sandwich. They're curious about why I chose peanut butter as opposed to something else. They're wanting to say, hey, I don't even like peanut butter. I'm allergic to it. Hey, do you know about peanut butter? They'll ask someone else. Now they're ready to go on to something else because peanut butter isn't really even that interesting. They would rather talk about shopping. And so they're, this is all happening for them 
They have, you will find them moving around, you'll find them fidgeting, they're laughing, they're talking louder, they need to do all of this so that their brain can even sort out what is the point of me telling them that I made a peanut butter or I made a peanut um, butter sandwich. So they hear the words, but in order for them to make any sense of those words, they have to have all of this other engagement to process that. And so a lot of times people will assume extroverts just want to hear themselves talk. Some of them do, <laughs> but it's not just that, or they want to be the center of attention. Some of them do, but it's not just that. They can't even make sense of what's important unless they're engaging with their world. That's how they're able to sort out what's important. And so, of course, if they need this external processing before they can even make sense of it, of course they're going to talk to a million people. Of course they're going to jump from conversation to conversation. Of course they're going to be in an environment where there is, there's lots of sound, there's lots of lights, there's lots of, of happening because they can't process things without all of that stimulation. Does that make sense? So completely different ways of processing things. But once you understand that this is what these two like, portions of the spectrum look like, now you can probably say, oh, it makes sense why I prefer to once I've been with friends, now I need a day to recover or, oh, it makes sense why my, my spouse is yapping, 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 and I'm trying to figure out what's happening. And then like two minutes later, he doesn't even remember what he said because he was just processing. Ah, that's the extrovert in him. Ah, oh, that makes sense. So understanding that that's what it is. It's not shyness. It's not, you can be a shy extrovert. You can be an introvert that is front and center. And you have people like Beyonce, who is also an introvert, who, how can you get more upfront <laughs> and outgoing and, you know, really involved in Beyonce, like her entire existence and how she's been able to build success is by her being outgoing and forward facing, but even she credits her introversion to that success because she's able to navigate it. She's not pretending to be an extrovert. She's not dimming her ambitions because she's an introvert. She's saying that it is both and. I am both an introvert and also I am highly successful in what I'm being called to do, my zone of genius. It's both of those things. So that was a, a longer description, but hopefully giving that example fleshes out and pulls out a bit of nuance for um, each of the listeners to find kind of where they are along those shades of gray. That was extraordinary. I think you've been following me around. <laughs> <laughs> Someone called me a I called me an introvert whisperer because oh, I was I was great. describing I was describing like this mental soup that's happened. <gasps> this is exactly that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Welcome to the club. You're closer to that side of the spectrum. <laughs> or the opposite. This makes sense why my child does this. Like, I don't understand why when I'm asking something, he can't just respond. Well, that's because his brain is trying to sort through all of this. But once he has his time to sort it through, when he comes back with a response, it's something that's very thoughtful and it's very deep and it's very, it's very mature. It's something that it's very meaningful. It's not a throwaway comment, even for a child. It's like, ah, this makes sense now. <laughs> It makes sense why, you know, I will be saying something. I'm just thinking through my thoughts and, you know, my, my sibling is getting upset because they thought that I meant all of those things that I said. I don't know what I said. I was just trying to figure out what I was thinking. Extroverted, introverted. <laughs> I got to tell you, I was a psychotherapist and I gave personality tests I didn't know any of this stuff that you just said, I'm going to be taking notes on this. <laughs> and I write a lot of relationship books and I'll probably be consulting with you. This is phenomenal. Thank you for you. I got to be on the show today. It's like, wow. And I've been blaming, I had a couple of brain injuries and I know why they drain my energy, but you just explained why all these years later, it's still, 
happens to me just like you described it. It's like, wow. Yes. It's amazing to have that type of clarity. And it's it's part of, of what I'm doing and part of my work. There's the work that I do individually with introverted women. And I'll come back to introverted women of color because they are my focus, um, but they are not my only audience. So there's the work that I do with the individual women to guide them around taking that vision of themselves that they have and putting strategy um, behind it and being able to live into it. But there's this whole other side that is about shifting the perception of what introversion is and how introversion is experienced because the the unfortunate disservice (laughs) that has been done um, towards introverts, one of them is that everything comes from a standpoint of why are introverts different, not how are extroverts different. Not how do people process things differently, but what's what's the deal with introverts and why can we not make it their deal? That's already a flawed view because it comes from the perspective that there is something inherently deficient about introverts and therefore it needs to be fixed or therefore it needs to be corrected or it needs to be changed. Totally false. But when you're coming from even an academic standpoint where you're doing research and you're looking at introversion as the thing to change or why does it work this way as opposed to the normal way, you're coming in with a biased view. That's one. The second part of it is that I don't know, I don't know who did like the PR for introversion, but they're terrible at it because introversion has gotten such a bad rep. And this notion that if you are introverted, then you're shy or you're antisocial. And if you're not shy and you're not antisocial, therefore you cannot be an introvert is besides wrong. It's incredibly damaging because you have people who have no problem with having conversations with people. They have no problem with being in front of people. They have no problem with giving talks or doing all of these things, but they just need time to recover from that. They need a beat to just let their brain breathe so that they can know what to do or know how to proceed. But because there's this idea oh, you're smiling at people. You can't be an introvert. I never would have known. You don't strike me as an introvert at all. People who say that, I understand what they mean, (laughs) but what they are actually saying is that introverts are inherently deficient. You don't seem to be deficient. Why do you work (laughs) and also call yourself this deficient thing? That's what they're saying. That is not their necessary intent, but those are the things that are coming across. And so for us being on the receiving end of that, we're hearing what you're actually saying (laughs) that, oh, you're an introvert. Introverts have something wrong with them. They don't like being around people, but you like being around me. You're having this conversation. You've got to be all right. (laughs) What am I supposed to do with that information? How is that supposed to make me feel, am I supposed to feel better? Am I supposed to feel complimented? Am I supposed to like be overjoyed that I'm not as broken mm-hmm. <laughs> as you thought that I would be? Like, I don't, I don't know how to process this, which again, introverts constantly processing. Now that whole dynamic is yet another layer for us to sort through because our brains are going through all of this with you saying, oh, I never knew you were an introvert. All of these different layers, it just adds more complexity and where it really becomes challenging. And and this is leading to why I specifically um, speak to, for, and about introverted women of color is that this faulty notion and this kind of association with extroversion, meaning that you know what you're doing, that you are going to be successful, that what you have to say is valuable because you're loud and you say it a lot, as opposed to as an introvert, you are deficient, what you, you're not checked in, you don't know how to associate with people, therefore I can dismiss you. That faulty association, it only amplifies the adverse effects that especially women of color are experiencing in the workplace. 
So here's an example of that, and this is how, how I came to work with, with this particular audience. Never my intention, up until two years ago, had no concept. I am an introvert. I am a woman. I am Black. I am an introverted woman of color. I am all of those things. Never in my mind thought this is an audience for me to do any work with. I started kind of down this path <laughs> with my own mental rant and frustration with how women of color and their experiences, especially for Black, Brown, and Indigenous women, how their experiences were being dismissed or overlooked when it comes to racial and uh, gender bias. It's like, okay, you're, you're too sensitive. You don't know. Maybe it was something else. General frustration with this. And I was having a conversation with a colleague and I, I told her how introverts, they're already needing to process. And now they have, um, they have managers who are making these comments. They have, have colleagues who are making these comments. What do they do with that? She encouraged me to look down this path, see where that goes. I started having conversations with women who I knew um, identified as being introvert or some type of introvert. I'm not an introvert. I'm a social extrovert or I'm a social introvert. I'm, I'm a shy, um, ex all of these vert <laughs> alternatives, really introvert, <laughs> but just not associating with that term. So as I was having these conversations with these women, I was hearing some very curious themes I was hearing them share time and again, particularly when it came to the workplace, of them being told that they couldn't be promoted, although they had been given across the board top notch um, reviews because their manager didn't know what they were thinking. And so since I don't know what you're thinking, I can't promote you. They were being told that they weren't going to qualify for a raise because they don't go and spend time with the team afterward. They were being denied opportunities for advancement because they were, there are two women in particular, completely second, separate circumstances, who were told that they were bad Black women because they're not loud and they're not always doing things. And so I can't even put you up for this. So understandably, those, those comments are cringeworthy at best. These were things that were coming up across dozens of conversations, these same themes of where these women were well-received across the board, no complaints about any of the work that they were doing. In fact, it's top-notch, um, no issue with any of the things that should make or break someone's advancement, raises promotion, except you are so quiet. I can't promote you. You are, are always to yourself. Is there something wrong? The reason why you're not talking to people when you come in in the morning and you just go to do your work. These things have nothing to do <laughs> with completing one's task. But these were the reasons that were explicitly being told to these women again and again and again. There was no, there was no, um, I guess, barrier depending on industry. Industry doesn't matter. Tenure doesn't matter. Geography doesn't matter. Um, the types of position doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're entry level or your upper management, anywhere in between. None of those things seem to factor or explain why this was happening as opposed to something else. What did seem to be consistent was that in each of these cases, these were women who were one who were introverted, or at least on the introverted side of things, and they were either Black, Brown, or Indigenous. This same pulling to the side and giving reprimands or being denied promotions and raises was not coming up for white female colleagues, also introverted, not coming up for fellow colleagues, men of color, also introverted, not coming up for white males who are introverted. They're not being pulled to the side to be told that someone was offended because they didn't say hi to them, not being told that they can't be promoted or they can't get a raise because they're too quiet, not being told any of these things. And so that has led me down a very interesting path, <laughs> one that I had no intention of going down. But 
even as I'm hearing these stories and I'm, I'm, I'm noticing the themes, that's the social science background in me um, and just the general research nerd in me. That's like, okay, well, this is happening a lot across all of these different points. Surely there must be some studies about this. Like someone's got some kind of the name of some type of effect or, or something. Like there's a, no, there's no research on this. There's no data about this. This has not warranted um, research and investigation. That's a problem, especially when just in my, in my own research, coming across thousands of women who are sharing their own stories that this has happened to them and not this has happened to them like that one time by that one boss, consistent patterns of this, thousands of women who are telling the near identical same story across all of these things that might be able to dismiss or under, like might be able to somehow express or explain why this is happening. So the work that I then begin to focus on is then how do we take these experiences that we know are happening, what can we do just looking at the workplace, not looking at family dynamics, because that's a, that's a whole other ball of wax. Um, any introvert who has forced themselves to go to a family function knows this well. <laughs> you are minding your own business. You are happy. You didn't want to come, but you got harassed until you said yes, and you came. And now you're getting the compounded harassment because you're sitting there quiet, minding your own business. So not looking at family dynamics, not looking at the effects on community, not looking at mental wellness, physical, not looking at all of these other issues, just looking at the workplace. As we're looking at the workplace, we're seeing that these choices that decision makers are making for who gets hired, who gets promoted, it's affecting, of course, that woman, but that also means in on a good day where the average Black woman will earn just under half a million dollars less than her white female counterpart. If she happens to be Indigenous, that will be nearly a million dollars less across her career than her white female counterpart. That is not taking into consideration the gap between white female and white male payment. That's not even taking, we're not even including the guys. We're just looking at us girls. On a good day, we're looking at this massive gap. That gap that could have gone to retirement that could have gone towards college funds for the kids, that could have gone towards home ownership, that could have gone towards your own educational aspirations. All of these are key factors for, um, for quality of life and being able to create generational wealth. All of that on a good day is diminished. So on top of these things, you have the boss who tells you, I can't read your mind because you're so quiet. Therefore, I will continue to pay you less. Even though you're doing more, I will continue not putting you up for promotions that on paper you absolutely should get, but I'll give it to someone else because you're too quiet and you don't spend time with us outside of the office. It becomes a much bigger issue and it becomes a, a much a much far-reaching implication and ramification of that. So the work that I do, not exclusively to introverted women of color, but primarily for them, because they are the ones who are being so adversely impacted by this, this intersection of introversion and this kind of faulty notion, but also they're the ones who have the most to benefit from it. Because even with considering these gaps, um, there's still, we still have the numbers for, um, black female entrepreneurs. They're the largest, um, they're, they're creating the most businesses, <laughs> um, in the country more than, than any other, um, demographic. They are some of the most college educated. They are, they're all of these benefits that now, and in consideration with the great resignation and all of this from the pandemic, so many people are leaving to start their own companies, do their own thing, because why bother? 
when you have these dynamics of introversion and how it's impacting things, well, it only makes sense that of course I'm going to get out of the out of here on the first thing smoking. <laughs> like, of course I am. Why would I stay here and deal with this? And I can do this in a way that's going to allow me to honor my introversion, where if I need to disappear for like five minutes or even for a day, I can so that I can recharge before I show up. Why wouldn't I do that? Why would I not? take advantage of that. So it's it's a much larger conversation. It's helpful to have that base understanding of the differences of introversion and extroversion in that gray area um, as we slide along that spectrum, but not understanding that and not having a, a true grasp of what it is and what it means has much, much broader implications and not for the best, unfortunately. This has been a major education for me. I'm so grateful for all that you shared and I can hardly wait to get this out for everybody. So let me ask you, I believe you have a gift for everyone. Absolutely. Um, one of the, the greatest joys after all of this heaviness, <laughs> one of the greatest joys that has come out of all of this heaviness is a recognition of different notable celebrities that are also introverts. I talked about Beyonce as being one of them. And so the giveaway that, um, that I'm sharing is the guide for the techniques that Beyonce actually uses. She credits these different techniques that I, that I talk about for her greatest successes. So her introversion allowed her to come up with the idea and to create the single ladies um, video. It allowed her to write the music like everyone knows, like Bootylicious. That came from her introversion. Um, her wanting to create um, Black is King and the Lemonade album and all of these iconic things that have changed the culture that came from her introversion. And she credits her introversion for being able to do that. So how did she do it? That's what you will learn. <laughs> How to be the queen, be in your own life. I will be grabbing that. <laughs> uh, I'm introverted and I'm great on stage. I'm great in a classroom, but at a party, that's the most terrifying place for me to be. Oh, it is so depleting. <laughs> And I had a friend who was very extroverted. I like to live in the country. I like to live alone. And she was always worried about me. She couldn't understand why I like to be alone. Mm -hmm. So what's what's the problem? Like, why, why would you want to be in your own company? Like, who wants to do that? Most introverts. <laughs> a lot less mental sorting needs to happen when you have your own space and you're kind of away from people and you have that ability to step away. It's, it's glorious to be in your own space and just having silence. Oh my gosh, silence, um, which is a, at a premium here in New York City. <laughs> um, I, live, I live in uh, the Hudson River Valley. So oh, you're not that far away from me. Anyway, is there, uh, you shared so much stuff. Honestly, I'm going to sit down and take good notes on everything. <laughs> is there a message that you want to share with everyone? Really, the central message is that introversion is not something to fix. It's not a flaw to fix. It's not an, op an obstacle to overcome. It's simply an invitation for you to live deeply and to impact greatly. So embrace your awesome and do just that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. What is the best way for people to reach you and to grab that gift that you're offering? Well, you can grab the gift at yesintrovertscan.com. That is the name of the book. That is the site where you can get these goodies um, and a lot more around introversion and being able to leverage that. And of course, there's my website that you so generously <laughs> talked about. So those of you who stayed this far and you want to see that image of archery, you can go to iembraceawesome.com. That is my home base. You will find everything that I'm doing and will do um, there at that site. Do you have 
uh, target date of when your book will be out because I can't wait to read it. Yes, the book releases on January 8th. Oh, because it's not that far away. Okay. No, not far at all. I am nervous and I'm excited. <laughs> it's number 23. <laughs> oh boy. Well, I thank you, thank you, thank you for the work that you do because I had no idea there was so much need for it. I just had no idea. So I'm grateful you're out there changing lives and changing not just the lives of the women who get to work with everybody they come in contact with. And hopefully it's changing the corporate thoughts and the whole paradigm is shifting. So thank you and thank you for sharing so exuberantly with us today. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, everybody remember to join our Facebook group, make a new friend, and ask questions. Be a part of the community. And I keep looking for the person who wants to create a book club with me so we can take you even further along your spiritual guide. And I think I found them today. And But be sure you download my free gift, that shortcut on quick affirmations, how to get them so they actually work for you. And you you got to ask questions to discover who you really are, what your life really is all about. I wish you a week filled with blessings and much in joy. That's I-N capital J-O-Y.